Chapter Thirty of Citadel of Fear by Gertrude Barrows Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Citadel of Fear, Chapter Thirty, The Gate Lodge Again. McClellan, well, upon my word. Rose descended from the car and advanced, hardly knowing whether to be amused or indignant. They had come through Undine a few minutes earlier, and by following the pike had found Reed's place without difficulty. But they were not the first on the scene. Two cars were standing outside Gerard's ill-omened gates, one drawn up by the wall, the other fairly blocking the road. As Rhodes' car halted, a man had turned away from the first car, and under the road light Rhodes had no trouble in knowing him. The stout detective gave something very like a guilty start, but recovered instantly. "'Ain't this your car, Mr. Rhodes?' he demanded, as casually as though their meeting here was the most natural event. The other two passengers from Rhodes' car had descended now. "'Cullen did come here,' exclaimed Cleona tensely. "'That is our car that he left outside.' I knew it. McClellan seemed affably triumphant. Forrester, indicating a second man who had emerged from the car's shadow, he says she ain't, but you can't fool me on a car I've once rode in. I says, Mr. McClellan, pardon me, but did you come out in search of my car, or because you changed your mind about the possible dangers of the house behind those gates? Now don't get sarcastic again, please. I'm a conscientious man, and I thought, since you were so worked up over it, we might as well run out and look things over. But seeing you've brought your wife along, I guess you drew it a little stronger than you meant over the phone, eh?" "'Tony,' Cleona pulled at his sleeve, "'my Cullen's in there, and we stand talking.' "'The gate is unlocked,' Bjornson called over his shoulder. "'I've left the shotgun for you, Rhodes, and taken the rifle. Coming?' He was already pushing through the gates. Rifle! snapped McClellan. Hey there, mister. I don't know who you are, but you haven't any license to walk in that man's grounds carrying weapons. Come back here. Mr. McClellan, please, please! In her distress, Cleona caught the stout detective's hand. Don't stop us. I tell you, the things may be in there that left that awful trail of blood down our hill. Do you want my brother's death on your soul? If your brother had seen fit to tell me of his suspicions, began McClellan, but was interrupted by a series of sharp, quick reports. That fool! he ejaculated, and sprang for the gates. But once inside, his intent to check Bjornson and confiscate the rifle underwent sudden alteration. Behind the gate lodge a curious scene was being enacted. The Norseman stood there, beating with the rifle's heavy stock at what seemed a tangled mass of writhing white fire. Can't kill a thing this with bullets, he shouted against the wind. Got that shotgun, Rhodes? Quick! Oh, watch out there! Watch out! The tangle of fire had fairly rolled away from him and toward the drive. An automatic spat viciously from McClellan's hand. He didn't know what he was shooting at, but even his conservatism admitted a need of shooting. Rhodes turned, only to have the shotgun thrust into his hands by an excited little figure that had dashed out to the car and back again while the men were thinking about it. A second later the mar of a ten-gauge duck-gun shattered the night. Rhodes, who had let go with both barrels at once, staggered back, but the double dose of number four at that close range had been very effective. The writhing fire fairly flew asunder and quivered almost instantly to darkness. "'What is it?' McClellan's voice shook suspiciously. For heaven's sake, what is it?" Young Forrester, who had stood his ground though unarmed, bent forward. "'Some kind of big white snake,' he said coolly. "'All tangled up with a tree branch. It's still wriggling. Going to plug it some more, Mr. Rhodes?' For that gentleman was hastily shoving fresh shells into the gun's empty chambers. "'No need,' Bjornson had stooped for a closer inspection than Forrester's. "'It's blown into three pieces now. When I came past the lodge, he continued, I heard a rustle, and then this, this creature came rolling out the door. Odd about the branch. Look here. The end of it was driven clean through the thing's body, just behind the head. Humph! I wonder who did that now. O'Hara, do you think? He would have finished the job, not left the thing alive and dangerous, 
judged Rhodes. Alive, but not dangerous. I think this is O'Hara's work. Above them the naked branches lashed, as if blown by the gusty laughter of some invisible giant. The gatekeeper's hard-dying fragments writhed feebly, but there was no light in them now. "'Golly, watch it bleed,' said Forrester. He obeyed his own inelegant recommendation cheerfully, but the others turned aside, rather sickened. "'Come away, Cleona,' pleaded Rhodes. "'Let Forrester stay with you in the car while the rest of us go in. I suppose,' he queried of McClellan, "'that you are convinced now?' "'Guess something's wrong,' conceded the detective heavily. Any man who keeps an illuminated boa constrictor like that in his gate lodge will bear looking at. And just then, through the shouting wind, a mighty reverberation shook the air, a long, dull, roaring sound, followed by a kind of tearing crash. Both noises came from deeper within the grounds, and before Rhodes could interfere, Cleona was off up the drive. She had not even a pistol for self-protection, but self was not concerning her. In a rush to the rescue, she no more stopped to consider what she would do on arrival than the dusk lady had thought twice before returning here after her lord. The main consideration was to get on the spot as quickly as possible. But unlike Talapalan's child, Cleona was followed by human reinforcements. What might otherwise have been a justifiably cautious advance was made at a reckless run that only caught up with its feminine leader in the shadow of the porte cochere. End of chapter 30